Budget overruns, brick devices, data breaches, building connected products is hard. Welcome to Over the Air, sharp, unfiltered conversations with executives about their IoT journeys, the mistakes they made, the lessons they learned, and what they wish they'd known when they started. I'm your host, Ryan Prosser. And this is Bill Brock. Welcome to Over the Air. Are you struggling with in-house fleet management? Have your Ansible scripts grown out of control? Has a Docker-first deployment strategy left you needing more? Well, it's not just you. At Peridio, we work with software teams at hardware companies so they can focus on their products and relax on the infrastructure. Are you interested in learning more about our device-centric CI-CD solutions? Talk with an expert today. Peridio.com. Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT Connected Devices and the Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, CEO of Vary, and today we're joined by Ricardo Lobo, CEO of Biontag. We're going to be talking about developing ultra-rugged sensors for challenging operating environments. Ricardo, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. It's a real privilege to be here with you, uh, Ryan. So you guys have built a, a great brand uh, in industry. A lot of people know you, but for folks that don't, give us uh, a couple sentences on Biontag. Well, so yes, uh, Biontag is a global uh, uh, business enabler, right? We, we participate, we were pioneers in Internet of Things. And I think we have a very, uh, the world's widest portfolio uh, that goes from UHF applications to NFC, dual frequency tags for either mass applications or to, as you were mentioning, rugged applications uh, in highly engineered uh, conditions. I think about businesses like yours a lot in IoT because uh, sometimes you see these uh, technologies that exist in a somewhat crowded space, and I often wonder about differentiation and you know how how you compete effectively. You guys have been very successful. What what's been your secret to competing in a space that that some people might consider you know a little bit crowded? Yes, I think we. We, backed by a pioneering R&D uh, DNA and now a, a, a wide team uh, across uh, our global platform, I think we were able to solve uh, big problems for big multinational clients that other companies uh, weren't able to solve. And that kind of uh, created a name for ourselves and allowed us to to grow globally uh, serving these clients, right? So that's, I think, one of the things. And then, of course, uh, once you are um, also in highly engineered uh, um, niched uh, applications, they tend to be more profitable. And you can also uh, focus then with that on the mass uh, thinner margin applications for widespread, let's say, more competitive environments that, that you know, are more crowded. Uh, which obviously you need to be as well for for the benefits of scale. A hundred percent. And, um, you know, we, we hear over and over that our audience is kind of out of practice engineers that are now running businesses and in business operations roles. I'm sure a lot of them are asking, OK, Ricardo, got it. But how do you go like you can't instantly be a global brand? How? Like, how do you solve that chicken egg problem of, you know, trying to break in uh, initially as a, no, you know, nobody is born a global brand. So you've got to earn your way to that place. H how do you solve for that? You know, for those folks out there saying, you know, okay, look, uh, we'll return to the technology conversation in a second, but business strategy, how, how did, you know, what was you guys' secret to go from zero to global brand? Yeah, so, so. Yeah, so uh, again, I think we, we were able to find, even when we were much smaller, ways back, um, trying to be in rele uh, relevant problems, right? So for relevant uh, uh, applications. And then for sure, when these applications are relevant, relevant clients are there, right? So uh, I think we were able to, to crack some issues uh, that other people weren't paying attention. As you know, I think... Uh, uh, and most of the, the listeners might know once, uh, you know, connected items started, uh, the majority was for apparel, uh, uh, UHF applications. So everything that was kind of out of that was not on the on a lot of the big players targets. So uh, if we're trying to, to fix somebody that 
that, that needed to read through metal or through liquids, if you needed something that was rubbed to withstand the years uh, uh, out there in the field. So all these applications, uh, for sure, there were relevant problems and relevant companies uh, wanted them solved. And uh, even in when we were small, they had to go to a small company because nobody was doing it. Uh, so, so there was that leap of faith from the clients back in the day. And that, of course, uh, uh, enabled us to grow together with our clients, uh, be it in the exclusivity market, industrial market, auto market, uh, when we were a much smaller company. So, so path from small to big for you guys involved solving, you know, a lot of hard problems. Maybe they had already solved the more mass uh, version of it. I think you've mentioned, you know, uh, some examples where they needed like a relatively inexpensive tag. They had a vendor for that. They had a very hairy problem that they couldn't find a solution for. You were able yeah. to lean on your kind of your R and D DNA, uh, was yeah. my kind of take on things. One of the things that you, that we had talked about offline that I thought was interesting was, um, you know, an application you guys are looking at right now, uh, maybe commercial is, I'm not sure where you're at in the commercialization cycle, but, uh, embedding sensors in tires can you talk yeah. about that this this you know I, I mentioned at the top of the show um that we were going to be talking about kind of ultra rugged yeah. not many applications that the average person will tell i mean you know if you put something in a tank or in a coal mine that's ultra rugged but for the average person i think their car tire is probably the most violent place in their life they may not think about it like that but like sure this is a really difficult operating environment what are you guys doing what does that look like and how has your dna made that possible for you absolutely so that's the typical situation so it continues happening to us uh even these days right so a couple of years ago uh the tire industry started getting uh, very interested in in tracking the tires right the whole life cycle of them so inserting uh a sensor uhf sensor when the tire is being vulcanized. So that already is something super rugged because it has to be vulcanized inside the tire, right? And then live with the tire for the 200,000 miles that it will drive, right? And uh, because they want to monitor when you change tires, swap from winter to summer, when, when uh, you, uh, the controlled inventories in the distributors, at the factories, at the car manufacturers, and also then uh, when the final disposal is going to happen, right? So tracking the whole life cycle of the tires, right? Regulations are also uh, playing a part in that. Um, and then, well, we had a tradition of solving these types of, uh, of, of problems and we engaged. Uh, and uh, that's something that we're right now launching uh, um, relevant products with for that. And I think that that's gonna, that's what we love because that's gonna unlock a whole new uh, vertical uh, for us to, to to participate in and, of course, uh, help uh, the, the technology to spread uh, in a different environment. So that, of course, forces us to move uh, from things that we have dominated before, such as uh, doing plastic uh, or injection molding or, or whatnot, to kind of uh, uh, other types of, uh, of technologies, induction coupling, uh, PCBs and uh, with springs and other things that 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 allow us to be inside tires, right, uh, in a rough condition. For uh, un uh, for for viewers not uh, familiar with the process of vulcanization, I mean, like you said, just surviving the vulcanization process, uh, which I, it comes, I believe the word comes from the Greek god Vulcan, which is how we get the word volcano, you know. But this is. Uh, <laughs> Ultra, yes. ultra, ultra high heat, intense. In high process. heat and high pressure, uh, for sure. Uh, and then for sure, uh, there's there's metal threads plus the thick rubber that that um, are not great for for reading, right? They they kind of give interference, so it has to be very uh, has a capability to read through these things, right? Uh, uh, to emit and the the signal uh, during uh, this type of uh, Faraday effect. And of course, then withstand rolling uh, on. Uh, so there's going to be more heat uh, when the rubber hits the road, uh, uh, and more pressure and more strain throughout the life cycle. Right. So um, it tests our engineering uh, uh, to the limit, and uh, and we're happy that that that's uh, now something that we're rolling out. 
I'm curious for you know uh, business leaders like myself. What what can you share about the corporate DNA of you know you've got these kind of like two camps internally? It seems you know on the one hand you guys are solving previously unsolved problems that require you know kind of an R and D DNA you know very cool very cutting edge uh, and then on the other hand you know clearly you've got some very efficient manufacturing capabilities that allow you to go compete and win where tenths of a penny are at, at play. Um, and you don't see a lot of times companies effectively competing in both of those spaces because they're so different. What yeah. does that look like for you guys? Like, how have you been able to foster both, you know, what are some of the challenges and, you know, for folks at home listening, like, what's the real, real that you can share where you're like, guys, look, here's the real talk. Here's where the challenges lie. And here's how I, I Ricardo yeah. kind of balance that. I'll tell you that once uh, I go back 10 years and uh, um, I've been with the company for eight years now, I'm in my ninth year and also uh, the companies that form our group today, uh, some started even before that, right? So, so 15, 20 uh, years back in the IoT space, so real pioneers. Um, and, and, you know, the factories back in the day looked like, uh, I would say, like an atelier, right? It wasn't a real uh, 24-7 factory, given that the applications were very niche uh, in, its, in their instance in the beginning, right? So we obviously had to uh, make uh, uh, these operations uh, as the adoption grew uh, into serious factories, right? Uh, luckily for us, um, there's another part of our business historically that started 30, 40 years ago that was the manufacturing of label stock, uh, which is a uh, uh, high volume, lower margin, 24-7 uh, uh, operation with complex machines and requirements for cutting edge industrial uh, processes. Uh, and, and so, so we benefited from that, that, which is another part of our, uh, our DNA once we were scaling up uh, operations, right? So we, that's, I think, uh, what helps us, for instance, now uh, as we move on, another trend that is very important in our sector is parcels and logistics, which is adopting now uh, uh, also radio frequency identification. Well, they want a very competitive sticker, right? So since we are label stock sticker makers, uh, uh, we can make that vertically integrated and, and uh, produce that in mass, which is kind of also part of our DNA. So operating 24 seven, being very sensitive to yields uh, uh, scrap, you know, all those things uh, have been with us for many years. So that, that helped for sure. Uh, it is a different mindset from, from of course, the highly engineered solutions, uh, but we are able to live in those two worlds. I think these are two good, you know, uh, attributes that we have uh, that are indeed not easy. Uh, and they came across also by some historic uh, things, but we've been, been able to benefit from that as we go. So uh, what, I, I, I know you have an engineering background. Uh, I'm not sure you know, how often you get to lean on that in your day to day, but I'm, I'm going to ask you about a topic I consider one of the most complicated in IoT land. You mentioned it, so I'm going to pull on that string a little bit, uh, which is RF. So we're, we're having some RF experts on the show um, mm -hmm. in the next couple of episodes. I'm not sure uh, in terms of how this episodes will air, if it'll be before, before or after this. So mm -hmm. it might've already aired by the time people hear this, but RF is, you know, we hear time and again, the closest thing to black magic that we have on this earth. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'll actually leave the question very broad, let you take it in any direction you want, but you guys must be as close to kind of, you know, practical RF experts as, as anybody could be, you know, I assume a lot of your products are RF based. What, what is, you know, what can you tell us about life with RF, you know, and some of the, the challenges and, uh, cause it, it seems that even experts, you know, are still learning every day about how to yeah. kind of harness this, this power. Um, yeah. and for folks out there being like, this is a very simple, you know, it's not simple. It's actually it's very complicated. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little well, bit about I, RF. 
I'll tell you that first and foremost, I, I'm a chemical engineer from background. And, I uh, saw that, yeah. Plus, plus, <laughs> so I, I threw I mean, you in the deep end. Yeah, so so I mean, I'm not an RF engineer. I was kind of a little bit scared of that uh, in university when I had to choose my engineering degree because uh, that was uh, for sure, I think, a harder part, at least for me. Some people you know, are naturals and think that's very easy. Uh, I, I'm glad that I'm at least technical enough to be able to put up a conversation with most of the technical team here at the company. Uh, but uh, what I can tell you is that uh, for sure, there's uh, some art to it uh, on top of the hard science. So antenna design uh, and form factors, that's uh, I think, uh, for instance, something that I, I, I would you know talk for, for one second. Um, of course, if you're reading a box, uh, there's space for eventually a large label. But even when you're talking about um, wanting a cheap label, you want the, the form factors to go smaller, right? And then also when you when you're trying to tag a, a small item, then it needs to be small just by definition. And then of course it complicates and stretches uh, the antenna design uh, that you're trying to link with the chip uh, the ra that, that has the radio uh, in it, right? So. That's a constant challenge for us to, to as the chips, uh, our new chips are launched, our antenna design and our label design needs to uh, always be propped up uh, uh, so that we can go through those uh, new and smaller form factors. I think that's something uh, um, that, that is, is a constant trend in our industry, trying to get smaller form factors, thinner labels, uh, and they can read and be more sensible than, than before. Of course, with huge antennas and large form factors, they read better. Uh, uh, so there's always that kind of tweaking in it uh, as we go uh, forward. Uh, but indeed, I just also would like to add um, the black magic part. I think that's the most exciting part of the technology, right? The fact that with no uh, visual contact, that with no... Uh, that with many items in parallel, you can read, you know, everything at once with unique IDs. That's really, I think, what what's exciting, right, and drives the value of the technology. So normally, you know, I, I would uh, I would ask you, you know, right now, what's next for you guys? But I, I want to add a uh, curveball, you know, that's mm -hmm. going to lead us into that. So this is going to be Ryan speculates on what might be next for you. And then Ricardo is going to answer the question through the lens of what's actually next. But the, uh, the world of tracking sure is getting interesting, you know, and you're talking about the form factor shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And, um, you know, at, at some point it feels like the low end by low end, I mean the low cost end of the sure. tracking market. I'm thinking like bananas, you know, so like sure. the tracking or, you know, whatever, or a, a avocados, or, you know, or mm -hmm. some, something very small, very consumer, you know, you need an ultra low cost tag. Um, are, are we going to see like spray on tracking, you know, something that isn't necessarily manufactured in the sense of how we think of it anytime soon, or, or like, what's the future of tracking? Where you, is there a moment coming where you guys are going to make the leap and say this isn't an evolution from yesterday's technology? We've actually jumped the Grand Canyon over to a totally different approach here. Are you guys? What are some of the things you're thinking about and doing in the background, um, or even that you you kind of predict? Hey, by 2030. I think the ultra low cost part of the market is going to look like X. Yeah. So what, what we know, right? I think from um, the, the, the chip design, uh, they're getting smaller and smaller. So I've been in the industry for nine years and the chips are already, I would say, 60% smaller than they were when I joined the industry, right? So that's, that's you know, uh, amazing. And that pushes the boundaries for our bonding machines for everything because the needles that pick these things up, they need to be small and small and more and more precise, the cameras, the data. Um, and I think that the tendency that is that it goes even further down. When I started, I would say uh, the cheapest uh, um, UHF tag would be, uh, yeah, I don't know, perhaps six uh, pennies, right? And uh, now they're a, a couple of pennies and people want, uh, when you talk about bananas or parcels, people want a penny on these things right in the future so that they can be literally on everything right uh, uh nowadays they are already on underwear socks i mean cheap items but people want to go all the way for instance into food so i think that we will see 
perhaps in 2030, yes, perhaps we will see the, the, the penny uh, um, UHF label. I think that that will happen. Now, something that uh, we do see and we study everything that comes across, people trying to have um, sensors that don't have actually a chip, that they're just somehow built in a printed electronic inside the antenna, a very simple code in it. Uh, uh, but I don't think that that will, will uh, the radio uh, uh, and the chip, I think, are very important for crypto. Uh, for security, for unique IDs and more complex situations. So I don't see that complete disruptive uh, uh, thing uh, coming our way just yet, I would say, in the next five years. Got it. Uh, and last question for you, if you have time for one more. Um, you exist at a very, your company exists at a very interesting crossroads in um, in this industry. I wonder what, what trends can you report that you're seeing that you think, you know, from the vantage point of, you know, mid year 2024, um, that you could report back to the audience? Yeah, so we do see trends uh, that are interesting. Um, sometimes when we're talking to folks about uh, RF uh, labeling and the tagging of items, uh, people try to, they, they come and say, oh, is there a GPS? Uh, plugged into it. Uh, um, well, not necessarily, right? That would be super expensive to real have. Uh, and, but people, some applications and clients, they actually do need real-time localization services, right? And for sure, you could plug a GPS on it and then it's super expensive with a big battery, kind of big tag. Uh, but, but there's something coming that bridges this kind of uh, discrete closed loop of UHF readers, uh, which is a, a Bluetooth uh, low energy, right? So that's something that is a, an emerging trend that we're already trying uh, and successfully participating in the market. We have a, a, a blue, Bluetooth low energy uh, beacon line that, that is new and growing every year uh, because that allows obviously for you to talk to every cell phone, uh, uh, every Bluetooth uh, uh, enabled uh, reader out there, right? And then for sure you get closer to real time localization. I think also that there will be uh, 5G uh, chips uh, or, or on some of these tags in the end of it. Then it talks to everything, right? Uh, all cell phones and networks uh, around. So I think these are interesting things. So we, we've always been, I would say, kind of a frequency agnostic, uh, or I wouldn't even say that, the frequency enthusiastic. Uh, uh, all of them are in, important, right? So if you want to talk to a cell phone, um, from a an user, an NFC already helps, but then it only reads from very close. Now, Bluetooth, low energy will allow cell phone to read from far. Uh, UHF, of course, has the, the cheapness of it and uh, the, the cost competitiveness of it in allowing to read from afar. Uh, and dual frequencies, Bluetooth, 5Gs, I think these things will coexist depending on the applications that people need. And that's why we want to be present uh, in all the frequencies of the spectrum, for sure. Incredible. Ricardo, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for the opportunity. And thank you for listening. Join us next time as we meet with another executive and talk about things that went wrong on a journey that went right.